Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to welcome you to our Sunday service. And if this is your first time with us, a special warm welcome. I do hope you really enjoy being part of our online worshipping community today. Coming up later, after our notices, Kate Chester Lamb will be bringing us our Bible readings. I'm going to be preaching for you this morning. And we've got our usual selection of hymns, which I hope you'll enjoy as well. Um, May this morning be a real time of blessing for you. And I hope you encounter the Lord as we worship. But why don't we start with those notices? First of all, let me update you with where we are up to on restarting church services. If you're watching this on the morning of August the 2nd, then there's still time to get over to St Mary's Handley Castle for an evening prayer service this evening at half past six. And then looking ahead to next weekend, to Sunday the 9th of August, I'll be presiding at Communion in Upton at half past nine. And there should also be a service at Welland at some point in that day as well, although we haven't quite finalised the time for that when I filmed this video. Uh, do check the website hopechurchfamily.org forward slash calendar and the weekly newsletter. They'll tell you exactly what is happening and most importantly, when. Now, while it's great that our services are restarting, we're also very aware that a good number of you are being blessed by these online video services. So we're going to continue to provide those for the next few weeks at least. Um, we are, however, going to be reducing the number of services of spiritual communion we do. Uh, we're going to stop doing them on a Sunday morning now because we're running real live communion services and we afraid, don't have enough priests to go around. Um, we are, however, going to be continuing them during the middle of the week on a Wednesday, uh, but not every Wednesday. And the next one will be on the 19th of August. Now, whilst there are some things about video church that are the same as normal church, one thing that is different is that we can't pass a collection plate round, which means we can't worship the Lord through generosity by giving him back what he has already given to us in stewardship. But if you'd like to know more about how you can do that, do please visit our giving page, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash giving, where you can choose which of our parish churches you'd like to support, and it'll tell you exactly how to go about doing that. Right, shall we be quiet for a moment and then we'll begin our worship. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day. So may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. And we're going to begin our worship by singing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Why don't you stand for this if you feel able?
everyone, do please take a seat. Uh, we've just sung of Jesus as the potentate of time, the one who rules over everything, over all of life. Sadly, it's often easier to sing of his rule than it is to actually obey him. That's why it's so good that he's a loving, merciful potentate of time, a loving, merciful king who sacrifices himself for our sake which means we can turn back to him and seek his forgiveness at any opportunity. Why don't we take a moment then to do that now? Reflect on your week. We'll have a moment of silence for you to do that. And then we'll make our confession using the words that will appear upon the screen. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, the focus of our service today is very much about how Jesus can transform lives. And the psalm we're going to say together now is all about transformation, not just of an individual, but also of a community or a nation. So we're going to say together Psalm 85, if you join in with the even numbered verses, which I've highlighted in bold for you. So let's say Psalm 85. Lord, you were gracious to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the offence of your people and covered all their sins. You laid aside all your fury and turned from your wrathful indignation. Restore us again, O God, our Saviour, and let your anger cease from us. Will you be displeased with us forever? Will you stretch out your wrath from one generation to another? Will you not give us life again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what the Lord God will say, for he shall speak peace to his people and to the faith, that they turn not again to folly. Truly his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring up from the earth and righteousness look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give all that is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before him and direct his steps in the way. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Why don't we respond to that psalm in prayer? Most holy God, when we come to you fearing the truth condemns us, show us how you meet truth with love in your word made flesh, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now here's Kate Chester Lamb with our first reading. The first lesson is from Paul's letter to the Romans. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, Paul spoke there of his longing that his own people, Israel, would come to faith in our Saviour Jesus. So why don't we respond to God by singing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Please would you stand for this. Thank you. 
people, do please take a seat. And before I bring us our message for today, Kate Chester Lamb is going to bring us our second reading. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they say. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Shall we pray? Father, your word is fresh to us every day. Speak to us of what you would have us hear from this talk, from this passage. For Jesus' sake. Amen. When people really meet Jesus, he transforms their lives. Michael Emmett came from a long line of London gangsters. His father Brian ran with the craze, and Michael followed in his dad's footsteps into the crime family until a, a fateful day in November 1993, when the police arrested him on a Devon fish key as he watched four tons of cannabis resin being unloaded from a boat. Emmett was sentenced to 12 and a half years at Her Majesty's pleasure, starting out in Exeter Prison, where he befriended the prison chaplain, uh, this wasn't a sudden burst of religious enthusiasm. It was merely that the chaplain had a telephone and would allow him to borrow it so that he could ring his girlfriend back in London. But one day Emmett was taken aback to hear that his girlfriend had started attending something called an Alpha course at Holy Trinity Brompton Church in London. Alpha is a, a course that introduces people to the Christian faith. It explains who Jesus is and why he came and how he can transform lives today. And it was something about the way his girlfriend talked about the course really struck Emmett. He heard that lives were being changed. He wondered if something like that could work in prison. And he suggested to the chaplain they should invite a team from Holy Trinity Brompton down to Exeter Prison, come and run the course there too. Now, the chaplain wasn't convinced. And Emmett had to work hard at persuading him to give it a try. I don't know if he was what they call an enforcer in the mob, but uh, perhaps that was how he persuaded the chaplain. But eventually a team came down from Exeter to run the course and it began a really rather wonderful thing, because in one of those sessions, something extraordinary happened. Emmett met God. Here's how he described it. I had this overwhelming sense that God is real, a feeling of an introduction, and it really filled me up. I remember words coming out of my mouth. It doesn't have to be like this no more. It doesn't have to be like this no more. Emmett spent time in three other prisons after that as he worked out his sentence before he was eventually released. And he took the Alpha course with him into each of those prisons, persuading the chaplain each time to run it. And then when he left prison, when he was finally released, he went to work for the Alpha course. And now he runs the course in prisons, not just in the UK, but all over the world. When people really meet Jesus, he transforms their lives. And it's perhaps never more obvious than with an ex-prisoner. The, the national average reoffending rate for prisoners is something like 58%. But for prisoners who've done Alpha and who then sign up to be supported by its sister charity caring for ex-offenders and mentored and linked up with a church when they leave prison, the reoffending rate is 17%. Because when people meet Jesus, he really transforms their lives. There was a dramatic transformation in our gospel reading too. Interestingly, it wasn't in Israel. Did you notice that? Jesus is across the border, traveling through the coastal regions of Tyre and Sidon. And then he heads south towards Lake Galilee, but not onto the Jewish side of the lake. He's in the northeast corner, a region called the Decapolis, where 10 cities had been established by the Greeks when Alexander the Great conquered the area centuries before. Jesus then is in Gentile territory. 
And if you know the gospel well, you'll remember that he's been in this area once before, because this is the part of Lake Galilee where a demon-possessed man called Legion lived among the tombs. And Jesus healed him and cast the demons out into a herd of pigs. And afterwards, Legion had come to Jesus and said, can I come with you? But Jesus said, no, go back to the people you lived among and tell them what the Lord has done for you. And Legion did that. In fact, he did such a good job of it that the moment Jesus returns to the area, crowds gather to see him. People start coming for healing. And so we read in verse 32, some people brought to Jesus a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. And Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears and then spits on his hand and touches the man's tongue. And the considered conclusion of a ton of biblical scholars is Jesus had heard nothing about COVID-19 regulations. And they don't really know why he did any of those things. But then verse 34, Jesus looks up to heaven, presumably to pray. And then with a deep sigh, says that word that is rather difficult to pronounce, ephatha. It's an Aramaic word and it means be opened. And the man's ears are opened and his tongue is loosened and he begins to speak. When people meet Jesus, he transforms their lives. Which all rather begs the question, how is he transforming our lives? And if he isn't, have we met him at all? That might seem a bit of a cheeky thing to say to a church crowd. We all know Jesus, surely. We've been coming to church forever. Well, yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean you've worked out who Jesus is. I mean, the people in our passage, they had a ton of advantages over us. They'd met Jesus face to face. They'd heard him preach. They'd talked to him. They'd asked him questions. They'd seen him perform remarkable miracles. But they still don't seem to understand who he is. Is it safe to assume that we do? This question of who Jesus is is the big theme of Mark's gospel. And it becomes a bigger and bigger focus as you get closer and closer to particularly chapter 8 of the gospel. We're in chapter 7. And this bit of the reading is kind of setting up the revelation of who Jesus really is that occurs in the next chapter. But at this point, nobody's really understood who Jesus is. And so he keeps telling them, don't tell anybody about me. Have you ever noticed Jesus does that a lot? He turns up in the town, does a remarkable miracle, and then says, don't tell anyone about me. And quite often they ignore him. Someone once said to me, it was a bit of reverse psychology, sort of like the old one about whatever you do, don't think of an elephant. Of course, what are you thinking about now? Well, when the service is going to end, obviously. But no, you're thinking about elephants, aren't you? Is it reverse psychology then? Is Jesus trying to get some good PR out of a tricky situation? I don't think so. All through Mark's gospel, Jesus has a problem with crowds. Crowds of people wanting him to endorse them. Crowds of people wanting him to settle their disputes. Crowds wanting healing. Now, he doesn't mind doing those things. But he says very early on that that is not why he's come. He hasn't come principally to heal diseases, but to proclaim the kingdom of God. The healings are helpful signs of God's kingdom coming, but it's the kingdom and it's king that is the main message. And people were getting so wrapped up in the miracles that they were missing the message. And there's a big clue that that's possibly what's going on here too. You see the description of the deaf and dumb man there? Well, the phrase used to describe him there turns up only one other time in the Bible. Those words for deaf and dumb are used in an Old Testament prophecy by Isaiah, written 700 years before, all about how God is going to send his Messiah to bring judgment and to put the world to rights, and his arrival will be heralded by the ears of the deaf being unstopped and the mute tongue shouting for joy. Now, Mark could have used a number of different words to describe the fact that the man could now speak, but using the exact words Isaiah did, and unusual words at that, tell us, but to make sense of this story, we've got to understand that Jesus isn't just a healer or a good teacher. He's the long promised Messiah, the one Isaiah and indeed the whole of the Old Testament point towards. The one who's going to judge the world and put it to rights. Getting Jesus' identity right matters. I was reading a story recently about a chap called Josh Peters who was in Manchester and he came across a very convincing Ed Sheeran look like. Now, if you don't know who Ed Sheeran is, well, you've probably broken the hearts of every teenage girl in the country. Ed Sheeran is a popular musician. And he, this Josh Peters fellow, wondered if he could convince people that he really had the real Ed Sheeran with him. 
He likes to do prank videos. And Peter's decided he needed to go to a place where people are obsessed with celebrities and possibly a bit gullible. And so he flew this Ed Sheeran lookalike out to Los Angeles, where they were mobbed by autograph hunters at the airport who thought they'd discovered the real Ed Sheeran. Then they went to a celebrity boxing match. And while they were there at the fight, some paparazzi photographers from the Sun newspaper spotted them and featured Ed Sheeran at the boxing match photographs all over the Sun the next morning. And then some more celebrities turned up to have their photos taken with the fake Ed Sheeran. And then rather more awkwardly, Justin Bieber appeared. I presume it was the real Justin Bieber. Um, and, and that was a bit awkward because Michael Peters knew that Ed Sheeran knows Justin Bieber. So they had to get away from Justin Bieber. Well, I suppose it would have been quite interesting to meet him, wouldn't it? Uh, and so they jumped in a taxi to go to LA's most exclusive nightclub, where they gained entry to the VIP lounge on the back of looking just like Ed Sheeran, and then got invited to spend the night back at the mansion of a famous but unnamed Hollywood celebrity. Next day, they flew home to the UK and they put a film on YouTube revealing all. Now, getting Ed Sheeran's identity wrong isn't a matter of life and death, though I suspect if I paid 50 quid to take my teenage daughter to see the lookalike sing, she might well kill me. But getting Jesus' identity wrong really matters. You see, he's not just a healer. And he's not just a good teacher. And he's not just a wise man or a magician or a prophet. He's God's long-promised Messiah, God in human form. The one whose death can truly save us. The one whose resurrection gives us new life. And that's why when people really meet Jesus, he transforms their lives. So how do we meet the Messiah? How do we meet the King of the Kingdom of God? Well, we do it exactly as Jesus tells us to. All the way back at the very beginning of Mark's Gospel, Jesus said the Kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. He's saying that the key to opening the gateway to God's blessing is to bow down before him and treat him as the king he is. It's an act of worship. And inevitably, that is going to lead us to say sorry for all the times we haven't treated him like a king. All the times we've disobeyed him and let him down. And if we're really serious about that, we'll want to change, won't we? Which is what that word repent means. And when we repent of ignoring our king, then Jesus has some good news for us. Forgiveness, a fresh start, a new beginning, and transformation, profound, radical transformation. Because when people really meet Jesus, he transforms their lives by bringing them into the kingdom of God where all things are possible. That's what he did for Michael Emmett and countless others who have been blessed by the Alfred Prisons Programme. And it's what he wants to do for us, too to change us from the inside out, back into the people he made us to be. So look, if you're wondering why Jesus isn't transforming your life, maybe it's time to once again repent and believe the good news. You see, in John's Gospel, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And that life begins not with a request for healing, but with a bowed head and a humble, repentant heart that seeks a new beginning. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we long for a new beginning in you. If there's anybody watching today who hasn't experienced that turnaround, that new beginning with you, may they give their hearts to you today. Bring salvation, bring renewal to each and every one of us that we may be your servants, servants of the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what's God challenging you about this morning? Why don't we sing this next song prayerfully as you reflect on that? We'll remain seated for Be Still, for the presence of the Lord is moving in this place.
Now why don't we stand and declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Shall we pray? We're going to use some responses during these prayers. The response is, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting God, we join together in praying to you for the needs of the church, the world, our communities and ourselves, trusting in your love, which reaches out from before the foundation of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, whenever we start to get offended by your generosity or open-mindedness, give us the grace to repent and join your rejoicing. Guard the church against self-righteousness and all rules and limits which you would not own. Guard also your church against the spirit of the age, that we might not try to be more righteous than you. Help us always to be, as your son Jesus was, full of both grace and and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we pray for your world. Forgive us when we're ungrateful, when spiritual blindness prevents us from appreciating the wonders of your creation and the endless cycle of nature. Forgive us for taking without giving, reaping without sowing. We pray for the farmers of the world, many of whom still use those methods described by Jesus. We especially pray that they may be treated with fairness for their labours. We remember those who work on the land here in Worcestershire. We ask your blessing on them in anticipation of a good harvest later in the year. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we thank you for the love we share with our families and friends. We recognise that they may have faults but they love us also in spite of our own faults. Help us to be flexible and adaptable in all our relationships and also capable of accepting constructive criticism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God and Lord of life, we pray for the gift of courage to face up to and cope with illness, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for it ourselves and for those who we now name before you. We thank you for those who through their courage have come through illness and for those facing the reality that there is little light at the end of the earthly tunnel. Give them courage to face their end, knowing you are a safe and sure guide in both life and death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, give us ears to hear and minds to understand the message of immortality for the children of your kingdom, so that we may look forward with patience and confidence to the time when we will join you in the peace of eternity. We especially pray for the bereaved family and friends of any we know who have recently died and are on that journey to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we thank you for the opportunity of being together in prayer. As we look forward to the weeks to come, we pray for an awareness of your love and support in all we do. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's continue in prayer as we pray the Church's special prayer for this week. Almighty Lord and everlasting God, we beseech you to direct, sanctify and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that through your most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul 
through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And gathering all our prayers and praises into one, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're coming towards the end of our time together now. As we finish, let's remind ourselves of the amazing love our Heavenly Father has for us by singing, Here is love vast as the ocean. And why don't you stand for this?
Well, thank you for joining us in worship today. Do please invite others to join with us as we worship online week by week. Don't forget to join in with our other services through the course of the week. Um, and also, if you'd like to join us physically for worship, we're here on Sundays in a building somewhere near you. If this is your first time worshipping with us online, I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be here same time next week. And if there's any way we can help you on your spiritual journey in the meantime, do please get in touch with the email address on the screen there. We long for the day when we can all gather together again. In the meantime, stay safe and stay prayerful. And so may the love of our good and generous God guide and protect us. May the hope of the gospel sustain us and bring us joy. And when we're lost or lonely, when the road ahead seems hard or when darkness gathers, may the light and peace of Christ be ours. Amen. Let's finish with the words of the grace. <laughs> may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all. Amen. Amen.